UCLA needs a dominant defensive day to set themselves up for the rest of the season. Why? Well, let's talk about it on Locked On UCLA. You are Locked On UCLA, your daily podcast on the UCLA Bruins. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey everybody, it's your favorite host, Zach Anderson Yoxheimer. You're listening to Locked On UCLA or watching it. Thanks for making Locked On UCLA your first listen each and every day. It's free where we get your podcast and it's available on YouTube. Like, comment, and hit that subscribe button. Thank you very much for your support. In the meantime, we're going to tell you this episode is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you got you has got you covered this season. More props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online where the game starts. And where this episode starts is the fact that the UCLA defense is coming off of their worst performance of the season and their worst performance for the most part since the beginning of the nine game winning streak that just got snapped in Eugene. The Bruins are coming off a game against the Ducks where they gave up 45 points, a bunch of yards in offense, got zero sacks and four zero turnovers. Why are some of these numbers so crucial? Well, one, let's get to it. The UCLA defense has been kind of thriving, especially a little of the Chip Kelly philosophy, but especially this year. And what key their 6-0 start was the forcing of turnovers with the bend but don't break type of defense. A lot of turnovers, whether it be the literal bad snap and the drop ball in the Bowling Green game back in week one, or to forcing Michael Penix Jr., who at the time and still is, one of the best passers in the country and one of the best at going deep down the field. Bruins forced him into two interceptions, two turnovers. And for the most part, UCLA has thrived off of forcing turnovers. That hasn't been the case. Or that wasn't the case against Oregon when Bo Nix continued to be one of the best in the country, just like Dorian Thompson Robinson in completing passes. Oregon's rushing attack, well, as vaunted as they were, they lived up to the billing. And UCLA's def- defense, they're not going to, for the most part, outside of the shades of what the USC offense has shown this season, they're not going to face anything, for the most part, in the rest of the regular season, outside of that one very big battle for the victory bell, any offense like the Oregon Ducks for the rest of the regular season. And Stanford, they're not going to come in and post, expectedly, a big 40-point outing. That's just not the way this offense is built. But the UCLA defense is built not only one to exploit the weaknesses in the Stanford offense coming in with a Corona kid and Tanner McKee, who's thrown six interceptions an offense overall. It's fumbled it 14 times, losing eight of them, where this is a UCLA defense that's prided themselves on the biggest turnovers forced in the recent three weeks of UCLA football was that big fumble forced in the game against Utah and returned to the one to set up that big touchdown against the Utes where the Bruins were able to go up big near the end of the fourth quarter against the Utes, a big dominating and accentuating big punch, gut punch to the Utes in that 6-0 and start for the Bruins. But then you go to Eugene after the bye and the Bruins seemed lost. Well, they should not, one, seem lost against Stanford, a team who won as we talk about turnovers to start is minus eight in turnover different in turnover margin. The Bruins currently sitting at plus five after the one interception thrown on Saturday against the Ducks. Plus five for UCLA, that means they have forced five more turnovers than they have turned the ball over, and that includes a couple of Garbers or Garbers interception. You have the South Alabama game where UCLA was putting the ball all over the field in that game. UCLA, for the most part, when they dominate or at least are pretty even in the turnover margin, They fared pretty well offensively and defensively. South Alabama and Oregon were those games where UCLA kind of fluctuated with the turnover margin. And even though it didn't truly make the difference in the Oregon game, the lack of turnovers forced or opportunities to force were truly alarming for the UCLA defense, who prides themselves on being a better a ball hawk secondary, ball hawk team which is what they need to turn into to lead themselves not only victory against Stanford, but down the stretch against the ASUs, the Arizonas, building into and culminating into that USC game and eventually the regular season finale against Cal on the road in Berkeley. 
Stanford overall, we've already teased this, but we'll tell you again, minus eight in the turnover margin. That's bottom four in the country at the FBS level. Again, they've thrown six interceptions. They got a, a non-dual threat quarterback, just your pro, pro you know, their 6'6 six, six guy, uh, Tanner McKee from Corona, and their top two rushers are down. The leading receiver is gone. This is a game where I would like to see a guy like ZZ Hearn, the guy who started his career out in Arizona, transferred to Wyoming, playing his last year of collegiate eligibility in the Pac-12 with UCLA, and like him to get his first career collegiate interception. Didn't get one in Arizona, despite a fumble return for a touchdown on a teammate's interception, where he picked up his teammate's fumble and ran it for a touchdown. Not in his stop at Wyoming, where he was he was excellent in his few seasons out in Laramie. And now here in UCLA, looking for that first pick. This could be one of those games where Azizi Hearn could come through and get one of those crucial interceptions and add his name to the list of guys with INTs in the stat sheet in the scorebook by the time the game ends. UCLA needs to force turnovers. That's a simple key to the game. But that's to get themselves back in the right groove coming down the stretch where it's all going to lead to where UCLA needs to do this to beat Stanford. But looming in the works, that USC game, the Trojans were the best teams at turnover margin, not turning it over and forcing turnovers. So UCLA's got to build to that point. Two, UCLA needs to force pressure if they want to get any type of turnovers. What did they do against Washington to fluster Penix? Well, they sacked him for the first time this season with one of their best players, the AP All-America midseason team member in terms of edge rushers. It's Leatu Latu, who comes in amongst one of the best in the countries in sack sacks per game. Didn't really register anything against the Oregon Ducks because the UCLA defense as a whole didn't register anything throughout that entire game, despite only allowing a field goal in that first drive for the Ducks. After that, UCLA truly, truly struggled defensively through that game. UCLA, if you compare up and down the the stat sheet from game to game, when they're able to generate pressure, they've had a sack in every game, but key, the one game they lost against Oregon, who is the toughest team to take down the quarterback with Bo Nix. Oregon has allowed the fewest amount of sacks in the country, one, through their seven games. Well, UCLA, if there was a game to not sack the quarterback, and not feel bad about it, well, Oregon is that game because they're the toughest team so far, the toughest offensive line to penetrate, and the Bruins proved they were not better than even the Georgia Bulldogs, who could not do so in week one despite their vicious beatdown of the Ducks. UCLA has had their problems getting some rush at times while all the names are being spoken about Leatu Latu, and I would like to see a lot, a lot more of the, the Murphy twins come through and get some love rushing up. Maybe some Kenny Churchwell get some love. Mo Osling, a lot of love after his big performance defense. But I'd like to see those guys come in and generate some pressure to allow the Azizi Hearns, the John John Vons, the Jalen Davies to get and add to their interception total or for Azizi Hearn, get simply one INT for his collegiate career. Because this is the game where he could and should be able to do so against the Stanford Cardinal where McKee, who threw for nearly 60 attempts in the week before against ASU, but with no touchdowns and no passing touchdowns overall for the Cardinal. This is a game to, one, be a ball hawk defense. Two, force turnovers. That's the thing. Stanford is near the bottom of the country. They allow three sacks per game. They're 111th. All right, what does that mean? Well, in the FBS... Officially, you've got 131 teams going by the stat site on the FBS level that are available for the FBS site. James Madison making the transition, so they're technically number one very well. It's 111 in the country. Not good. There's only about 20 teams worse than Stanford in terms of allowing sacks per game. Washington, who is one of the best at generating pressure against Stanford with a big sack performance against the Cardinal, UCLA should again be able to generate pressure against the Stanford team that has not been able to withstand it thus far consistently throughout the season. About three sacks per game, but you know, a little bit of outliers here and there, but still UCLA needs to drum up the pressure, lead itself to a sack or two, which is all the Bruins have needed defensively to truly inflict punishment on the opposition's offense. 
and lead that to an interception or a fumble or a timely turnover forced and eventually pull away from the opposition come the second half. Those are some things UCLA needs to fix defensively, and we're not going to go schematics here and there. It can, value, it can change from week to week, but that's just something, as Chip Kelly said earlier in the week, they saw things in the defense that were very fixable, correctable, and they should do so and inflict some punishment against the Stanford team, who by all accounts, from what I've seen, UCLA, if they want to prove themselves to be one of the best in the Pac-12 for this season here in 2022 and continue to frustrate the likes of George Klyovkov as the Bruins begin to transition to the Big Ten, well, they want to force turnovers and dominate and try to win this game by as many scores as angrily as possible to not only atone for the loss to Oregon, but atone for all the Bruins' losses to the Stanford Cardinal in the recent past. All right, well... As stinky as it's been, and as stinky as we keep talking about the Oregon game, well, just know, like, if you are like me and have some stinky siblings who are in high school and play athletics, just know that you have to probably deal with them being around you, your stinky siblings, being like, all right, why do you have embarrassing underarms? Well, well, they're going through puberty, or they have some embarrassing odor. Well, they're, ath- they're athletes, they're, they're going through puberty, they stink. But there's a way you can get, we can all get the people we love, even our goofy younger siblings, to have the confidence to no longer have embarrassing underarm sweat or odors by having the confidence to wear sweat block. You can wear what you want without the embarrassing underarm sweat at all. No odor. The sweat block wipes were featured and tested on the Rachel Ray show by firefighters. Yeah, they go through the meat and grind of the stinky and the smelly and the dirty. If you know someone or someone you love is experiencing embarrassing sweat or odor, try Sweat Block. Save 20% with the promo code LOCKED ON at sweatblock.com. Again, that's the promo code LOCKED ON, two words, and you can save 20% or more on the promo code at sweatblock.com with the code LOCKED ON. All right, no more stinkiness. Let's get down to business. UCLA. Their offense, now after kind of piggybacking off the defense, things that need to change, and especially with the Stanford game, could be a nice beginning, UCLA offensively. All right, they can kind of figure things out. The running game, there's nothing really wrong with the running game, even though Charbonnet 150 yards in a losing effort. One, I think this could be a nice game for the Bruins to try and give Charbonnet a nice, you know, day off, if you will. He could be a very big key for UCLA to win this game. And maybe with the Colorado-like day where only had nine carries but still rushed for 100 yards and a few scores, that could be one of those games the Bruins would like to see him get against the Stanford Cardinal, who allow over 187 yards of offense rushing the football, one of the worst marks in the country. As you continue to hear, there's a lot of things that Stanford does not do well that UCLA has succeeded at this year. And running the football, while this isn't exactly something that the Bruins need to change, no, it's not something they need to change, but it is a nice chance for UCLA to give Charbonnet a bit of a a rest day, you know, as we saw him get against Alabama State, shockingly, and some lighter loads throughout the season, like that South Alabama game, before building up and taking the bulk of the carries when he's needed to against Utah and Oregon. But my big key For the UCLA offense, as it seems to be the key around the UCLA football fandom, red zone offense. The Bruins overall are just 33 for 40 when it comes to red zone offense. 25 for 40 when it comes to red zone touchdown efficiency. Those aren't the best numbers when it comes to finding, all right, not just scoring, but finding ways to get into the end zone. And then punching it in to get six to seven points, even in the college game. You, the extra points aren't always crucial, but ending it in the end zone to get six and score consistently. It's been a bit of the, a bit of the Bruins' problem this year. They aren't exactly crazy on the big play, but they've certainly had their fair share. UCLA, again, let's tell you about this, 33 for 40 when it comes to red zone offense overall. Some of those are a little different depending on the knee or going after it late like they were against Oregon. There's different ways that could go wrong. There's the one time UCLA won through the pick against Oregon 
There's Garbers throwing a pick in the end zone. And then there's that South Alabama game where UCLA in the one-yard line coughed it up after having a touchdown. So those are three of the seven scoreless instances off the top of my head. But still, that scary number is that 25 for 40. That's only about 62% of the time UCLA gets inside the 20. We're all feeling good, right? Just like UCLA started that game marching down the field in Eugene and did not end it up with a touchdown. And while it might have been frustrating and a sign of things to come, well, that's been a sign of the things UCLA's dealt with all season long. UCLA and their two worst performances in the red zone are the two games they've struggled the most. Also, ironically, to the two games they struggled with one, forcing turnovers, getting sacks, and generating pressure, one, the South Alabama game, and the one that just was played against the Ducks. UCLA against the Jaguars and the Oregon Ducks were 4 for 11 in just attempting to score touchdowns against them in the red zone. 4 for 11. Those are not good numbers, and those were the games that they had to struggle with. Although they had a lot of success against Utah, 5 of 6, ending a majority of those in the end zone. Washington, well, a lot of the, the two drives were stopped when it came to going deep in the red zone on fourth down. UCLA got stopped. But still, a trend that a troubling trend that needs to end right here, right now, and that is my one bugaboo with this offense, is... What's the way? What's the one way that it's going to change? Well, UCLA just needs to find ways where, when there's a lot less room to work with, how are the receivers going to get open? Jake Bobo's found ways to make spectacular grabs in the red zone to make touchdown catches for UCLA almost the last few weeks exclusively for Dorian Thompson Robinson, just making big plays, toe tapping in the back of the end zone, weaving around Husky defenders, or even big grabs. Throughout the Oregon game, even though he was a bit of an, it wasn't in when the game was still pretty close. He still had 100 yards and a touchdown, but a little bit different there. So that's my one bugaboo with this UCLA offense saying, hey, that number 25 for 40, I'm going to circle it 30 times right now on my notepad that you guys can't see on screen because that is a crucial number. UCLA. If they get in the red zone maybe two times, if they get in the red zone five times against the Cardinal, they must, must convert. And it's not just red zone efficiency. UCLA has been one of the best teams at third down conversions all season long, but that's when you have the bulk of the field to work with. UCLA amongst the top three in the country when it comes to converting third downs. The other subcategory here, third down conversions in the red zone will be very crucial to UCLA's chances to get into the Pac-12 championship game from not only one just beating Stanford, but that's something that's got to change moving forward. Speaking of change, we're going to shift gears again and continue this trend of talking UCLA basketball in the last segment. Pac-12 media days came and went for the basketball front. Mick Cronin with Tiger Campbell, T Tiger Campbell and Jaime Hawkins Jr., two seniors for the Bruins, two beloved seniors, the veteran leaders, who are leaders against the San Diego State Aztecs in that closed-door scrimmage, leaders on the court, leaders off the floor. They will be crucial amongst many Bruins, as they were those speaking leaders at Media Days. Well, regardless of the funny, awesome, dumb, stupid questions that may or may not have been asked, I watched, those, I watched the segment with UCLA and even more afterwards. Here are the quotes that stuck out to me and the two highlights that were pretty interesting for me at the Pac-12 Media Days. And one, for Pac-12 Media Days, it is always an opportunity for the new Pac-12 Commissioner George Klyovkov to voice his opinion and his very, very terrible displeasure, his, whatever, his distaste, however you want to say it, the worst of the worst. He voices his opinion on about how bad and how unliked and how terrible the decision was for USC and UCLA to transfer and move whatever it is their own version of the transfer portal conference realignment Pac-12 to the Big Ten whenever it happens he always tends to make a big fuss about it so one it was the commissioner who you can see his quotes being pu pushed around social media whether it be UCLA fans SC fans they don't like this move uh, blah, 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 whatever it is the financials don't back it up I don't talk to fans, and he continues to push the narrative of, one, it's going to be a dumb move, two, the very minute chance that UCLA doesn't go 
hoping to keep the idea that, all right, this is what happens. Remember, Martin Germain was supposed to be the Pac-12 basketball representative for the selection, the basketball selection committee. He was yanked off that, and he talks about how there's the 10 schools that are important to the Pac-12 at the moment in moving the conference forward, always kind of keeping that little side eye to UCLA and SC because of the move to the Big Ten. So there's always that big weirdness, and I think I saw that Dana Altman comment about, yeah, you know, USC hasn't done much in basketball. UCLA, well, what have they done? Come in second in the conference tournament, second in the conference. So he's talking his trash, Oregon men's basketball head coach, about how it's been the Ducks in Arizona, which it has been recent years, despite a lot of favoritism in the preseason polls to UCLA in the last few years since Mick Cronin's taken over. But it's a little bit interesting as UCLA begins to build the program in the right direction into a nationally relevant program year in and year out again. It just happens to be when they're leaving for the Big Ten. So that was highlight number one at the Pac-12 Media Days. The commissioner voicing his opinion in another sport where the coaches can talk about, like the opposition, about what they think, or like Mick Cronin, who pretty much was like to say, mum is the word, it wasn't my decision. Like Chip Kelly, golfing, everybody seemed to be golfing when they heard the news offseason, whatever it may be. Nobody really wanted to talk about it, especially on the UCLA front. Mick Cronin is like, we're talking about these players right here who will not be around when the Big Ten days come around. I'm going to talk about this team with a lot of freshmen who also may not be around when the Big Ten days come around. So he was very, very, very enthusiastic about his team this year and energetic and bombastic about the idea that they talk about anything, anything in regards to the Big Ten move. Which leads us to our final thoughts on the media days. Here are a couple of quotes I thought were interesting. One little sub quote he kind of threw in there, which is something other than the just guys they were focusing on, Jaime Jaquez and the likes of Tiger Campbell. He said something along the like of, in one of the questions, a very small quote, but we need David Singleton, Dave Singleton to be more productive. He's getting a little bit more years. He got that super year. We need him to be more productive, which is one of those guys he kind of singled out in the media days. They already threw out the Amari Baileys, the Adumbonas, the Andrews, whatever it may be, throughout the whole media days and various interviews and sidebars and whatnot. But the nice little underlining there by Singleton, a guy who can shoot the three, a lot of production being needed. That was a nice little interesting mention I took note of with Singleton being mentioned by head coach Mick Cronin saying, all right, this is a guy that's got to step up if we want to be successful. So that was an interesting note I took of there. And then the funny quotes, which he always, which he all directed in funny and also slight in slightly joking, but serious manner when it came to the likes of Tiger Campbell. One, they're obviously coming off their scrimmage against San Diego State, so we could play off that, seeing how well Tiger Campbell did. But he kept preaching to the media and saying, I've been instilling in Tiger's head that he needs to shoot more now. He's one of the best three-point shooters in college basketball, saying, quote, he's a veteran, so he knows not how to upset me in practice, but he must hunt, using the word, he must hunt shots, in kind of a paraphrasing quote here, in Steph Curry mode, kind of hunt his shots from the three-point line. Tiger Campbell coming off back-to-back double-digit point-per-game efforts in the 20. 20- 2020 to 21 season and the 21 to 22 season, but last year Tiger Campbell doing it from three over 40 percent and over 80 percent from the line, building up his shot percentage at a much better spot from the point guard level. So he's saying, "All right, we're not playing around. We're not met. We're not worried about the replacing scoring of Johnny Juzang leaving, and also Jules Bernard, who is a very key guy down the stretch for UCLA men's basketball with all those." big-time double-digit scoring efforts. But it seems like a lot of emphasis going forward this year will not only be, yes, just Tiger Campbell and his ability with his almost 3-to-1 turnover ratio and his ability to get some steals and take care of the basketball, but with about 25 shots per game opening up with Bernard gone and Juzang gone. Yes, with Juzang and Bernard, that opens about 25 premium shots, which is what I'm saying as guys who would take volume shots and be go-to guys down the stretch for the Bruins for games. Of course, with Hawkeyes being quite a bit banged up in the most recent year, a lot of those shots will go to him. 
but who will the rest of those marquee shots with UCLA having a bit of a three to four headed monster. If you don't even include Cody Riley's departure, there's a lot of shots up for grabs. And a lot of those be taken by freshmen, some key triggers from Dave Singleton, whether you get a Dembona cleaning the glass down low, whether you have Amari Bailey, Dylan Andrews, who can all fill in Tiger Campbell is one of those guys. I think as UCLA fans, we used to get used to him scoring the rock a bit more. Last year, I believe, what, that season high of 27 points for UCLA, for Tiger Campbell, who was a key contributor, yes, and can take over games for UCLA at times. But as the redshirt senior from Cedar Rapids, Iowa, we might have to get used to Tiger Campbell being a more lethal and important scoring option for UCLA. He scored 27 at USC as his season-high total against the likes of the Trojans on the road in the Galen Center. So for the Bruins, we'll see what it means with Mick Cronin asking more of Tiger Campbell moving forward. Of course, it seems like, yes, that career high, the 27 against the Trojans on the road in a Pac-12 game, but it seems like a lot of it is the mixture of the veteran presence with guys who have been there, done that, and then the youth, the excitability, and the potential can make this a very interesting year for the Bruins, which seemed to be the theme of the Pac-12 media days. But I thought the things that stuck out, especially one, Klyovkov, Klyovkov does whatever he wants in terms of voicing his displeasure with the move. And then two, Dave Singleton, a guy that Mick Cronin kind of mentioned, all right, he needs to pick up things. Maybe this is a coach speak or just one of those guys he mentioned. Throughout media day, sometimes you get asked a bazillion questions. Coaches have to throw out a bazillion names. But the one I caught was Dave Singleton. And then the fact that Tiger Campbell, who's coming off a year where he had about nine shots per game, may take six more shots per game up to 15 or to a Juzang level and maybe slightly more than we would see Jules Bernard take on average per game last year. So it'll be interesting. Hawkins will get his shots. Mari Bailey will be instrumental. Even Tiger Campbell off the ball, Mick Cronin was saying, will be a focal point of the offense still when he doesn't have to bring the ball up and can get his shots then too. So that'll be interesting to see as we all are waiting for the Bruins to take the court. I know they keep talking about the exhibition November 2nd, but I truly care about November 7th when the regular season actually opens against Sac State, one of two 8 o'clock or later tips that week against the likes of Sac State and then Long Beach State at the end of that opening week. So we're all excited for basketball around the corner. Football gets Stanford around the corner as well. In the meantime, go check out Locked On Sports today. Make that your second listen today. It's got one of the takes of the day. They've got their biggest stories in sports. They go beyond the scoreboard and behind the scenes with local experts and insights that only Locked On can provide. It's available whether it be on Odyssey, whatever you get your podcast, YouTube, just check it out and make that your second listen. In the meantime, thanks for making Locked On UCLA your first listen each and every day. Thanks for your support. Go hit that red subscribe button on YouTube. Thank you once again. In the meantime, UCLA fans, get those hands up for an eight clap. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. U C L A. U C L A. Fight, fight, fights. This is Zach Anderson, Yox Iver saying. Good afternoon, good night, good morning, whenever you watch this, listen to this. Thanks for tuning in. This has been Locked On UCLA. Go Bruins!